Okay, Rajiv, are you ready? Yes, sir. I'm ready, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, with the permission from uh, 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 my uh, coordinator, coordinators for today's uh, webinar, and uh, on the be behalf of Nepali Society of Neurosurgeons, I thank Dr. Uh, Dr. Aditya Gupta uh, to come for the to come uh, here. And um, uh, without delay, now I will start my present webinar. So the topic choose, I have chosen today to, is uh, about the neural navigation. See, the, the navigation um, means it's a guidance. It's a guidance. So it's a, a study uh, that, uh, that focuses on the control, control and uh, guidance of a movement from one place to another place. This, and from this first slide picture, you can see the concept of navigation has evolved from the marine world. When the sheep and the boats used to travel from place, place to place, and they used, to, that time they used to travel without much guidance. So the, they thought there should be some kind of guidance which will help them to come out safely from place to another place. So in 11th century, when first time magnetic, magnetic, magnetic compass was evolved, it was first time used in the marine world. It was applied, it was used in the sea. And because only looking at this magnetic uh, device, they used to travel based on the direction of the wind. And in 15th century, uh, Mariner's astrolabe was developed. It was, uh, it is, it is from on this basis, and the principle is that they used to look at the latitude of the star or moon or the sun and compare with the attitude of the ship over the sea. This is how they used to localize themselves in the sea. In the 18th century, when mariners <laughs> developed, it has, it was, it, it, it was that time it was believed to be the most, most uh, accurate method of localizing them in the sea. And that time it was compulsion in United US Navy and in all the compulsory to keep in all the ships and boats. The golden time started when radio direction finding were developed. But uh, this process took many infrastructures, like you have to keep the many radio stations in the different places. And by contacting through the radio, they used to travel from places to places. And a much safer time came in 1940, when radar was developed. In the radar, by just looking at the beep of the light, they used to travel from anywhere. And it was the safest mode of navigate themselves. It, it was compulsory. And after the invention of radar, aer aircraft were, were commercialized to fly. And nowadays, global positioning system, which is based on satellite system, this is actually owned by the United States, um, uh, United States government. So the things have made so easy. If if you remember, in even my time when I used to travel abroad, I remember I used to have a paper map in my hands to look for the direction. I used used to ask people on the street about the direction. I used to go to the stores to ask the direction. This, I mean, it, I have seen that time, but the now, now the see, see you have a GPS everywhere. Everyone has GPS in their cell phone. And with the help of GPS, you can reach anywhere very adequately. It only does not show you the path. It will also show 
the time to reach the place and whatever you want to know. So similar concept, GPS is what, what is, an, is a navigation system in, neuro, in neurosurgery as well. So satellite is a localizer device, which is the camera and the radar is our patient's reference frame and display is almost similar. So it's almost similar concept. So these are the interoperative imaging modalities used in neurosurgery. Way back, starting from way back in 1895, when uh, Rowenzen developed plain X-ray. And uh, plain X-ray, it, it was not only used to diagnose the disease, it also helped to plan accordingly. From the, looking at the X-ray of the skull, who, neurosurgeons who diagnose many, many cases, many diseases, like pneumocephalus, any fracture, even looking at the presence of calcifications of the pineal gland, deviation of the calcifications from the X-ray, they used to diagnose the site of the lesion. Similar thing, ventriculography. When Dandy cannulated the ventricle, he used the contrast. This is how they used to localize the diseases, to localize the mass effect areas. Igas Moniz, in 1927, when he developed cerebral angiogram, after them, again, looking at the angiogram, they used to diagnose, not only the diagnose the disease, but, but also to plan accordingly. Ultrasonography was developed in 1970. See, but uh, it is still not widely used because of uh, uh, its uh, uh, little bit uh, drawbacks. But uh, I think this is uh, one of the very nice device which uh, can be used in neurosurgery. Though we have only ultrasonograph, which gives two, dimen two dimensional images, but uh, and because two, two images, you cannot uh, clearly see the, uh, clearly see the uh, margins of the tumor, like, or for deep seated small lesions, you know, it's some troublesome, but if you have 3D ultrasonography, um, definitely it is not lesser than uh, intra-op CT scan or MRI. Golden time in neurosurgery, it is started after invention of CT scan by Onspell in 1973 and, and MR imaging by Paul in 1973. After this time, neurosurgery totally changed and then developed PET and SPECT and so many, like in MRI, different type of images were developed. So despite all these interoperative localizing tools, people were still not happy. They wanted something, something more accurate reason why they developed image guided navigation. This is one of the uh, example of pneumoencephalogram. By looking at this X-ray, in that time they used to localize the lesion. This is a uh, ventriculography by Dandy. You can see the Dandy's cannula inside the ventricle in the contrast. So from an X-ray to, to, to the neuronavigation where today we are, the difference is almost 125 years. It took 125 years to reach us here. And the history of neuro, neuronavigation is about 20 years only. So what we are today, it's not built in few few days a year. It's because of the work, experience, dedication from our ancestors, from learning from the past. They look at the scenario, what used to happen in the past. In the past, they used to cut and see, like exploratory laparotomy, exploratory bore holes. And also this is, by doing such procedures, they used to find the lesion, they used to localize the lesion. In the, and, and even today, what is there is seeing the surface, 
you you look the images and you preserve those, those images inside your brain and you use that brain your first uh, your thinking thought process in the surgery okay now what is almost it now it's you see through the surface is neural navigation so you don't re only rely on your images you in the real time by the by putting your tip of one instrument you can clearly see the lesions localize the lesion so this is what neural navigation system is it is the set of computer assisted technology which is used in neurosurgeon which is used in neurosurgery by neurosurgeons to guide or navigate within the confines of the skull or vertebral column during the surgery principle of neural navigation system principle of neural navigation system is best to tell you where exact the tumor is second how to reach your target safely and third is to let you know where you are working so if you know all this prior to your surgery and during the surgery i mean this is the safest thing for you and confidence for yourself safety for the patient so this the neural navigation actually it is based on the principle of stereotaxy and stereotaxy it means it's three dimensional arrangement or order so image guided surgery is an operative technique by which correlation between imaging studies and the operative field is provided stereotactic surgery is never new you know stereotactic surgery was started around 80 90 years ago so 80 90 years ago they used to do a lot of functional stereotactic surgery for psychogenic and uh, uh, functional neurosurgery it was very famous that time but but after the liver liver dopa come into the market role of stereotactic surgery almost died almost vanished that time only non stereotactic functional neurosurgery in the form of dorsal column stimulation were only done but again after the invention of ct scan and mri in during the mid of the 70s again uh, stereotactic neurosurgery revived and uh, now you see uh, stereotactic surgery by using brw frame or crw frame or lexin is so most popularized and it is being used all over the world very widely it was uh, uh, horsley and clark who first yes. uh, made this uh, stereotactic frame but the, it was applied in animal model only give up the drawback of this uh, frame was that uh, it was not flexible it was not adjustable it was fixed for certain uh, kind of level only so uh, in 1947 spicer and voices voices first time developed stereotactic frame in and in later later in 1948 lex lex had developed first arc centered frame and gradually in between this time many many type of stereotactic frame were developed you know but like by talere talere who is a uh, japanese neurosurgeon he also developed a frame which was very popular at that time So you Tally can that. see Tally that. Tally that. different kinds of uh, uh, frame. Some disturbance. Can can someone mute all? Doctor Amit, can you mute mute all? I said I said not host. Doctor Rajiv, I am not the host right now, so I cannot man manipulate it. Eh? Mm. 
So different kind of uh, uh, framework developed, like by Japanese, by Lake Sale, by Cocos, many times. There were proliferation of stereotactic frames. So it was, it was these were all uh, frame-based stereotaxy. There were drawback of frameless, uh, frame-based stereotaxy. And uh, to overcome this, frameless stereotaxy was developed and the first frameless stereotactic system was developed by David Roberts and Associates in 1986. And um, the good thing about the frameless stereotaxy is uh, uh, you don't need to yeah. keep the patient at the fix. You, uh, you can tilt the head during the surgery. Sure. So the advantage of a frameless system was the ability to track a surgical instrument or probe in a real time and project its position onto the preoperative CT scan or magnetic images. These are the essential components of uh, a neural navigation system. One is uh, a navigation system with a monitor. You see the, where you where the uh, uh, where it comes with camera. And second is uh, imaging data which displays in the monitor. And another is patient reference. This is this is the reference uh, reference patient's reference arch. Which uh, just close close to the patient's head. So they are different for optical and electromagnetic uh, navigation system, and then different different specialized instruments. Now, the three cells has got very important role in neural navigation because this is the real marker will you localize the how you localize the lesion but um, i mean it is advice always to use pudi cells in all the cases pudi cells has to be kept free or from before the surgery pri prior to imaging acquisition until surgery complete of the surgery but uh, like there are conditions like electromagnetic neural navigation system and you can do without the use of fiducials. So fiducials is the Latin word, it means trust. So it, it almost if you have fiducials in the cranium, chances of error are very less. So navigation is based upon targeting relative to known reference points. There are different kinds of uh, fiducials are available in the market, like bone fiducials, like bone screws, and skull implanted fiducials, but they are not used these days because they are invasive. So the simple to use are adhesive, uh, adhesive markers like like this. It's so simple. It's a fiber fiber material. You can uh, you can uh, add, 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 add it to the skull to the scalp anywhere. And. Uh, Another is without the fibri cells, where you have you can use uh, cranial markers like tragus, tragus, or canthus, but you know usually they are difficult to locate. Once you drop the patient, it's difficult to locate. These are the important steps of neural navigation system. First is obtaining preoperative images in the form of any images, CT scan, MRI, MRI, DTI, anything. And next is registration of the patient and correlated with the images. Third is intraoperative localization. Fourth is intraoperative control. Fifth is obtaining intraoperative images and fusion with preoperative ones. This is usually, step is usually, you have to must be done in function during the functional surgery. And finally is visualization and surgery. So this is the how technical details of the procedure, how you start the, in, in the display. So it comes with what procedure you want to do, like tumor resection, sound, sound placement, or spine uh, pedicle screw, whatever procedure you want, you have to start with this uh, selection. See, the, in the right side, in the right side, that is, you see the optical eyes, means that is, uh, optical camera and another is 
that's an electromagnetic. So what kind of navigation system you are using? This is, uh, and then you obtain the preoperative images of the patient. It's most important uh, process, step in the neural navigation is registration. If there is error during the registration process, your whole, you will have a difficulties even you will not able to you know, use the navigation system during the surgery. So it has to be very precise and concise. There are two types of uh, 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 registration process. One is when you apply the cells in the scalp and uh, by touching, by touching those cells, you register the patient. And uh, another is Usually this is done in uh, optical, optical type of navigation. But if it is uh, uh, electromagnetic, then electromagnetic, they are not wireless. They come with some attachment. It has to be attached with a magnetic uh, emitter, near to magnetic emitter. But the, electro, uh, but the optical is, you see, it's wireless. Wireless because it reads, it reads infrared coming from the cameras. So these are called glands. They are usually disposable, but we use in many cases. Just screen it and we use it. So in trace type of registration, uh, fluid are, fluid shells are almost none, not used or very less. And it's very quick. It's less than a, less than a minute. So no, no extra consumable, no extra probe required. This is the setup of setup your of room. 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 On the left yes. side, the left side the, um, uh, meter. Meter. opposite to your is the uh, display where you have to look. And if you are using electromagnetic system, then that a magnetic emitter has to be placed close to the uh, head of the patient. Or if you are doing spinal surgery, it comes flat type of magnetic emitter, which you put uh, below the, uh, in, in the, in the table. Next step is instrument, instrument verification. You have to verify the instrument, what you are using. You can verify any instrument you want. This is how the registration process with toss method starts. Computer will show you three points, known anatomical landmarks, like first is tip of the nose, and you have to put the uh, put your uh, pointer, the tip of the nose, like number two uh, in the nasion, zone, number three, like one of the, um, anywhere, like orbital rays or cataracts, anywhere. So once this process is done accurately, you start, you start registration process. This is how the registration process is starts. You start, you start by touching, by touching, and you know if you and if you don't touch the scalp in between the registration, there is the chances of having error is always high. So try always touch adequately with the scalp. After the completion of the uh, uh, registration system, this is what you see in the uh, monitor. You see in the real time, wherever you put the tip of the probe, you will clearly see the margins. You will see the lesion, and then you plan accordingly. You can see edges, anterior, posterior, trajectory, whatever functional MRI you see, tracked anything, and you uh, continue your surgery. So this process has to be repeated again after you drape the patients, after patient. So because of uh, this, all, everything precisely now you can plan your size of your craniotomy and the trajectory. And pre-op data is uh, uh, collected in either uh, CD-ROM or in external hard drive. So this is the uh, so-called patient's reference frame. This is very important. It has to be kept close to the uh, patient's head. 
or spine. If you are doing electromagnetic, electromagnetic emitter that has to be kept close to the head or close to the spine. This is very important because it, it comes with, see, multi, multiple glands. And this is, the, this is what uh, infrared picks up. And, and from this, the images, uh, it goes to the, your pointer, and uh, this is how you navigate the lesion. So once the registration process is completed, registration system can display the location. So commonly display arrangements include, must be in all three sections, coronal, axial, and societal. You have to look at all these three images. Like in one of, one of these cases, you can see the lesion and boundaries of the lesion in all the section of the brain. And this is finally extent uh, of the evaluation of your surgery. Device tracking. There are two types of device tracking. One is uh, elect, uh, optical and another is electromagnetic system. So it refers to use of the navigation system local, localizing technology to track an instrument or probe in space relative to the patient. What happens in optical tracking system is here. So it uses camera as the localizer and the camera has two lenses so that it can see the positions of track devices in three dimensional. So it is based on the three, uh, theory of trigonometry. It, it has active, active tracking system and passive tracking system. In active tracking system, camera detects IR light emitted by LEDs on the system, while in passive tracking, the camera detects IR light reflected by the spheres on the instrument. This is how a trigon is made. But uh, the very important step in optical system is line of sight. It has to be very straightforward, clear to your instrument, or if you are using CD scan, it has to, it, I mean, it must see your CD scan uh, sensors. This is uh, the setup of, of using optical tracking system. And uh, then you see the, lens, the cameras. So these two cameras, the two camera, these eyes must see all four sensors in the CT scan machine and the instrument you are using. Another is electromagnetic tracking system. It is based on the generation of a magnetic field and the presence of coils in the tracking devices. They are not, they are never wireless. They, are, they come to the wire. So it has magnetic coils in the pointer. This is how it works. And uh, it's a very simple, you know, see it first, it was a uh, stereotactic uh, frame-based system and then frameless system. Now it is electromagnetic, which is for, I think it is very simple to use because you don't need to put a uh, uh, patient in the headrest. You can move the head at any time if once uh, you are you are doing the surgery with the use of optical navigation system, you know head head is fixed, you cannot move it, and you know putting the three pin is always troublesome for the patients, especially pediatric population. Advantage of this technique includes its abilities to provide tracking without the need of maintain of free line, and then you don't need free line. If you use optical one, you know you need sometimes many times your own head will obstruct you from showing the, from displaying the navigations. This is an electromagnetic system. Uh, this system is attached in the table and you see that is uh, the black thing, which is close to the head, is the electromagnetic, this is called emitter. In the head, it comes in this shape, while you use in the spine, it is flat. It is like a x-ray cartridge. You can put it beneath the body of the patient. So the advantages of electromagnetic navigation systems are, you can use it in traumatic head injury patients who have like multiple skull fracture, you cannot uh, put the three pins. Or if you are doing away craniotomies, or it is very uh, good option, another option for pediatric populations. 
and uh, there are other many advantages as well. No line of sight issue, simple plug and play like yeah. This is one of the example of uh, a pituitary macro adenoma case. So this is a, a patient uh, is getting intubated and you see the arrangement in the operating theater. And so you see there is a, there is a tram on the base of the table. This table is uh, very special. This is, this is made up of the carbon fiber so that uh, it is uh, radiolucent during the surgery. And another beautiful thing about this table is you can rotate this table in 360 degrees. So that uh, like if you are doing cranial surgery, usually in this position, you keep the patients. If you are doing spinal surgery, it has to be perpendicular. And uh, after anesthesia, uh, you take the top imaging if you are planning. The, but if you are planning to take intraoperative imaging, it has to be with attachment of the this patient reference frame. And uh, this is intraop imaging of that pituitary case. You can see this. It was a case of uh, pituitary with a little bit uh, dense area, probably a case of apoplexy. And this is a video I'll not show so, not so because it's too long. So and. Uh, all the, uh, all the instruments, they come on sterile and sterile. So after you grab the patients, you again use everything, everything you use in sterile form, definitely. So this is the after excision of the tumor. We had doubt whether it is blood or residual. And then after waiting for a few minutes and washing, finally uh, we did second time intraop CT scan and it was almost uh, uh, a complete excision of the tumor. So the major advantage of the use of neural navigation system is you exactly know if the tumor is left or you have excised it completely. These are the few cases of um, um, uh, uh, biopsies, that I, like in this case. See, it is so close to the ventricle. So uh, and reducing the tumor without piercing the ventricle can be achieved very safely. Another case of, another case of this thalamic tumor, you know, you know all these cases are uh, easily done by the residents. They do it uh, because it's so simple. I mean, you display the images, you plan accordingly. And if you know, definitely you have to know the real anatomy of the brain. This is another case. This is probably callosal, callosal lesion. And uh, this is a supracellar cellar lesion. And uh, this is another th left thalamic lesion. And uh, this is a case of uh, posterior fossa tumor. As I told, in case of other surgeries, you may not need to use the furicials in furicials. But if you are doing posterior fossa tumor, or if you are doing uh, in prone position, as there is no, uh, uh, may not many anatomical um, landmarks, so it is always advised to do it uh, with the use of fiducials, you use uh, optical navigation system. The beauty of the navigation system is, like it was a case of cerebellar lesion, and which was almost ISO, uh, ISO intense. And then uh, the technician, see, is, that's technicians, he isolated this tumor in different color so that you can clearly re, uh, uh, isolate, isolate from the normal tissue. Clinical application, you know, there are, it is written there is clinical applications like small cranial, uh, intracranial lesions, skull based surgery intracerebral biopsies, intracranial endoscopic. Yeah, in, even during the endoscopic third ventricular stomy, and people are using uh, uh, navigation system. And the study had shown that ETB uh, by uh, using navigation system, injuries are less compared to other method. And definitely widely used in functional neurosurgery. So these are the clinical applications written in the textbooks 
or in the many in many many literature i think if you know the time will come when all the procedures including traumatic extradural hematoma evacuation all other procedures will be done with the use of navigation systems why we are not using this system it's because of it's a, uh, because it's a new and it's because of expensive expensive as the use increases the cost will definitely come down and it will be we'll use it in all the cases so it is useful in providing orientation to the surgeon with sufficient application accuracy it facilitate a precise planning of craniotomy it define the tumor margins and the limits of extension useful in localizing localizing encased and displaced vascular structures you can see tumor extension and position of the osseous landmarks they have drawback see this is so big this is this is long even longer this is this is even longer so you know the probe is bulky the view of the surgeons and while you are using it during the surgery you have to again look at the monitor so chances of injury to the brain is there it's like you do oh, it's like uh during the ic use of icg you have to look at the monitor and uh, you know you might sometime uh, injure the vessels or tissues so the requirement of an uninterrupted line of sight between the lid and the camera and um, patient head head cannot be moved if if we are using optical system but if we are using a, a magnetic system you can easily head uh, uh, you can tilt the head another drawback is you are if you are using usually we use microscope so the between the scope and the uh, and the surgery side distance are very less so it distorts it again distorts many times there are conditions when even uh, uh, surgery using navigation system were failed and uh, like this another tiny lesion so usually um, uh, after we use less stereotaxy compared to in uh, uh, frameless other near navigation system is frame based but uh, as the results are almost similar but um, in such cases where we uh, don't have positive uh, results we use uh, frame based surgeries and see the um, uh, pitfalls of the the thing is you have to put it under the local anesthesia you take the you send the patient in ct scan machine with this head frame which is troublesome difficult for the patients and um, this is how you you plan uh, plan accordingly and um, another challenge is for anesthesiologist with this frame during the, i mean putting the endotracheal tube they need a special uh, dedication and uh, this is one of the another example of pineal region tumor biopsy and the um, uh, probe are so fine so uh, that even in the post op images you don't see any scarring and uh, one of the common complication of this i mean these procedures during the biopsies are intracerebral hematomas hematomas but uh, luckily in our series uh, i have till now we have not seen any such complications so that's all about cranial uh, navigation now i'll talk a little bit about the spinal navigation so the spinal navigation was uh, brought in use uh, almost a decade after the cranial navigation it came only after frameless uh, surgery for frameless cranial navigation system so the history Uh, is not uh, old so these are these are the uh, conventional uh, intraoperative spinal navigation as we discussed for cranial like direct visualis visualization surgeon's knowledge is the most important navigation system no doubt experience and judgment plain x ray see the uh, still many centers uh, they uh, operate by using only plain x rays but the drawback is uh, it gives only one plain image and then you have to wait for the image to come and then you start the surgery 
Uh, CRM is widely used, even we use, uh, but the uh, limitations of CRM is uh, you can, you will have only static images and it has a lot, it has a lot of radiation. Every time you bring the machine, back the machine and time taking is also very uh, long compared to other. And different other types are like uh, SSCP, MEP, and ETC monitoring. And to again, uh, overcome these problems, image guided surgery in the spine were also applied. And uh, New, uh, spine navigation to use of navigation system in the spine is not as as straightforward as in the cranial surgery because uh, there are a lot of movement in the spine surgeries starting from the positioning and uh, so fiducials they are easily violated so for minimal invasive MIS surgeries you you must need uh, some kind of fiducials like uh, which are made of the carbon polymer or gold, you have to use it. And uh, there are different day comes different types like cylindrical or coiled. And based on uh, this, uh, only you can uh, proceed for the surgery. So the challenges are it's the use of percutaneous, percutaneous fiducial markers are difficulty and uh, intra-metallic fiducial marker, markers and uh, uh, it is a lot of uh, metal artifact. So to come over those problems, Foley and Smith reported to use the anatomic landmarks again in the spine, like spinous process or lamina or pedicle or pars, that as a registration method, this is what we are doing. So you see, this is the uh, uh, dynamic reference array. This is called dynamic reference <clears throat> array, which is clamped in one of the spine. And uh, this is how registration starts and the picture is displayed there, all three section. And uh, this is how you register. You put the tip in wherever you want, at least three uh, anatomical uh, uh, site, like a spinous process or pedicle or parse, at least three place and you confirm the uh, trajectory accordingly. This is interoperative CT based. Uh, I mean, in the all in all cases, of like not not like in the cranial cases where you obtain the pre-op images, put it in the monitor, and you operate. For the spine surgery, you have to do uh, interoperative CT scan, and only real-time surgery can be proceeded. So you, this is the patient is getting a CT scan, uh, the required area. And you see, uh, this is the localizer. And uh, uh, also you can see the dynamic reference array, which is attached uh, into, into the one of the spinous process. And after opening this, after doing the uh, subperiosteal dissection, after exposing the bony landmarks, you send the patient for imaging, intraoperative imaging. These are the fixed picture, how displayed in the... And um, now prior to surgery, you know, size of the pedicle and you plan trajectory accordingly you you can see the vital structures around around your uh, surgical site and uh, exactly very accurately you can calculate the size of the uh, screws diameter of the screws and trajectory of the screws any any instrument you can navigate any size you see there are multiple holes it depends upon the size of the instrument so according to the diameter you can um, navigate any of your instruments even in one case of the tumor which was i mean very uh, <clears throat> not clear uh, even in the mri it was less uh, contrast optic so we thought uh, interop navigation might help and actually it helped to not only the exact localize the tumor and um, for the total ex for the total excision of the surgery. So for uh, navigation system, all the images has to be uh, acquired in a special format like CT scan should be less than one millimeter thick. <clears throat> this is uh, this is uh, in the spine surgery. Uh, electro where, where when you use electromagnetic field then that is the uh, magnetic emitter which is placed below the chest 
So the advantages of, uh, of spinal navigation are accurate. You can accurate plan of incision and trajectory, safe placement of implants, especially in anatomical critical areas, guidance for posterior incision and approach for minimal invasive implant placement. This is very good for MIS in the spine. And uh, many studies have shown that X-ray exposure is much less than what in the conventional, uh, conventional methods. And uh, multiple intractable, uh, uh, multiple treatable indications like cervical and high thoracic dorsal instrumentations to routine lower lumbar surgery, complex deformity surgery, tumor treatment, and surgery planning. So both pre and intraoperative images can be registered for navigation. So is the navigation in spine surgery necessary? Um, you know, if you, I mean, many study has shown that without navigation, chances of uh, vertical breach is almost 20 to 30%. But with the use of navigation system, it is the chances of misplacement is uh, uh, less than 2%. So it allows 3D image in the real time and uh, it has definitely uh, less complications because you can see the vital surrounding structures. It reduces reoperation due to malposition and it is very good to use in the small pedicles and in case of altered anatomy and deformity cases. And as I told you already, uh, that uh, radiation is less compared to the other conventional uh, type of navi uh, imaging modalities. There are technical pitfalls of navigation system in the spine cases, like in obese patient, you know, the ray is hard, difficult to uh, penetrate. So chances of error are very high. And definitely there is surgical learning curve. I tell you, use of navigation will add you extra 1.52 hours, sometimes three, four hours. So this is frustrating for a surgeon, but if you look at the patient safety at the end, you know, uh, so at the, this is very uh, difficult learning curves and uh, you need a special surgery, carbon fiber surgical table and you have to drip many times during the surgery because you take images two times and registration process is also not so straightforward in the spine and uh, and there are certain considerations depends upon the level of the uh, spine, like cervical spine, which is in case of hyperlordic spine where the surgical field is less, then you need to fix, fix the, uh, in the headrest, you must do it. In case of thoracic spine or thoracolumbar spine, see, uh, this is another good for thoracic spine, thoracolumbar spine, compared to uh, 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 this fluoroscopy or pleuroscopy because, because it is inside the thoracic case and images, you know, you don't see so clearly, but in neuro navigation, it is very clear. The only drawback is uh, you have to keep the patient apnea during uh, this uh, uh, interrupt image in the apnea strat. In the lumbar spine, in lumbosacral spine, this patient reference array has to be kept in the idea crest. To conclude about the spinal navigation, use of navigation in spine surgery has improved the safety of spinal instruments, instrumentation. It is it improvement in navigation technology will continue to expand its application in spine surgery. And this technology, however, should not substitute for a thorough knowledge of spinal anatomy and traditional method of instrumentation, definitely. After you know all these and it will be much better this year. But without knowing, navigation will never help you. So uh, in about uh, one year, we have operate, we have used uh, navigation in around 65 cases. We use uh, navigation system in 100% cases of tumor excision because of it is very helpful. It is very, really very helpful for pituitary. Uh, I mean, chance you, you clearly see where is the carotid or optic chasm, and you, even you can uh, nicely see uh, the uh, bony, bony, bony is an, uh, spinoid anatomy, presence of any septations. It is very clearly seen. And uh, we have used it, we use it sometimes um, planning for tumor biopsy, like one case catheter placement in cyst aspiration and in pedicle screw placement. 
<clears throat> so despite use of navigation system, we had inaccuracy in two cases. The histopathology were negative. So to conclude, neurosurgery will never be the same after the introduction of neuronavigation. The possibilities for the application of neuronavigation to contemporary neurosurgery are practically unlimited with the potential to supply better guidance, orientation, and localization, and hence a higher confidence level for the surgeon and improved outcome for the patient. If you have these instruments during the surgery, definitely your confidence level is very high. This is not the end of the navigation. So what is the future of navigation is, future will be cost effective, intuitive, ergonomic, user friendly, accurate and precise with possibilities for not only structure and physiological, but also functional and biochemical multimodal image fusion and interoperative real-time update of image data integrated with robots. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you, sir. And uh, uh, very much uh, uh, deserve you. Uh, the, the, this topic was, you know, somebody should have talked about this way long time before. And uh, so let me, before I ask a few questions uh, and uh, take, take up questions, uh, let me uh, thank Aditya again. Aditya, you are there? Yeah, hi. So, uh, and, and Rajiv, thank you very much for joining this conference. Your presence is very valuable. Our politicians are fighting in the borders. <laughs> and now, you know, science is beyond politics. So we are sitting together and sharing knowledge. And, uh, you know, that's, that's science, you know. We, you know. we are beyond borders, beyond politics. So it's so nice to have you in this forum today, uh, Dr. Aditya. No, it's my thank pleasure. you very much. It's my pleasure. And, and I, am, I wanted to thank Rajiv for an excellent and very exhaustive presentation. Uh, thank you, sir. I learned uh, many things uh, afresh from his presentation. And I think it's been a very comprehensive, very informative uh, presentation. Thank you, sir. So a few of the points that I want to mention from my side uh, is uh, that uh, about 25 hospitals uh, in Nepal is having a, a full-time neurosurgical departments, and probably only five have neuronavigation system. So this, there's a severe limitation of use of neuronavigation in our country just because it's a formidably expensive. And, um, you know, there are a lot of equipment that is coming from Latin America where the cost is pretty low. And I remember a gentleman, uh, engineer, who came from India. Yes. And um, he wanted to develop a system, but then nobody supported him there. So we worked with him for about two years. And uh, then he developed a very simple system, neural navigation system, which we are using. And uh, which is uh, almost one sixth of the, you know, cost. And it is, uh, it, they are marketing it from India yes. and it is good enough, you know. So it takes you where you want to go. And as you have rightly said that, you know, when you, when you work on posterior fossa, you know, there's a severe limitation of um, uh, any uh, navigation system and potentials that you have put, especially on posterior fossa because there's not much of landmarks. And uh, sometimes we use uh, navigation stereotactic combined, you know. When you want to reach the definitive target, then we will use um, uh, uh, stereotaxy. And then once you, we reach there, then we use the navigation system, sometimes very rarely. But, you know, stereotactic system has got, you know, it's a, the precision is in millimeter. And uh, whereas a uh, navigation system, the precision is not to that extent. So, you know, you cannot put DBS or you cannot make lesions with um, uh, navigation system. And uh, as you know, the most important and the limiting factor in navigation system is brain shift, which uh, 
nobody has got an answer till now but in your setup i can see that you have got a o arm so you can you know in between you can correct your position and then you know re navigate yourself to the correct position and the best use of it would be there will be no brain shift when you are working on a skull base especially on skull base because the, the brain shift doesn't work there so overall this was a very insightful uh, talk and uh, thank you very much and let's take uh, some uh, questions from the audience thank you namaste risa bolra hi risa uh i i have one question most of the images that you showed for navigation with ct based even for thalamic tumor biopsy i would suggest mri based pictures rather than ct based i know right so what is your comment about it a uh, very straightforward answer is we have intra op ct scan so we are, we frequently use ct scan here yeah, definitely otherwise mri has better result compared to uh, ct scan but as we have intra op ct scan we we have to rely on intra op ct scan. you can fuse your uh, mri images with the uh, ct scan that would be much more appropriate and accurate right see, see for uh, such lesions where only to take biopsy you don't need, i i don't think it, you must need to fuse it uh, definitely if you are doing some uh, functional surgery you have to do it and we have to do it okay hello Yes, Pawan sir. Namaste. Yes, namaste. <laughs> Thank you, Rajiv, for a very wonderful presentation. I really, because I had an opportunity to have a uh, observation of the imaging 23 years back, and I see the technology has <laughs> entirely uh, advanced, and which is really now it is not understandable to me currently. But anyhow, your presentations made me to understand it, and. i would like to know there are few things that do you need any consumables during the surgery which you use throw and then you again uh, need patient to buy uh not actually actually no till now no yeah you use uh, i mean as i told that these are the these are the gliens they are actually disposable but uh, we, we use it we are still using it so patients do not need any extra cost for that not nothing zero rupees for a patient and how much it is helpful as as a assess is all right and direction is or trajectory is all right but is there help of this in the extent of the excision yeah definitely yes sir it's uh, you know uh, to see the extent of the lesion and uh, or like the uh, about the brain shift which is one of the problem in navigation so uh, it it can be a myth but um, if you are using intra op uh, imaging system then you clearly see how much you have resected or how much is left there only navigation i mean only pre op based, based on the only pre op image you can miss the lesion but if you use intra op ct scan or mri chances are almost less thank you thank you sir Dr. Rajesh, Hi, it's me, Dr. Prakash Pode. It's a Thank nice you. presentation. Thank you. So, which company you are using? Is the Medronix uh -huh. or Brain Lab? Fortunately, we have both uh, Brain Lab and Medronix. Rajesh, yeah, we have both Brain Lab and Medronix. So, do you suggest uh, which which company do you feel more comfortable with, or any suggestions uh -huh. with respect to the choice of the company, since uh -huh. you are using both the companies? uh i think both are the same still the same i don't see any differences in the technique okay both are same you can buy any one okay uh, dr thank Rajiv, you so that was a very good presentation thank you for that um uh, my query to you is like what has been your experience uh, while using the um, navigation with the fusing of uh, fusion of functional mri or dti images um i i uh, i never spoke of this functional cases in our institute because we are not able to start it yet okay so my request yeah uh, can, can i can i say something on that yes yeah, sir please sir uh, sometime we are using a 3d ct angio uh on our aneurysm cases um 
we incorporated 3D uh, uh, NGO, CT NGO, to the needle navigation system to localize, you know, when the aneurysm is, uh, you know, uh, not well localized. Sometimes you can use that, but uh, not with GTI. Richard, have you used GTI with uh, navigation? Yes, so we have used GTI with navigation. Now, yeah. what can be done is, uh, in fact, uh, the system which we have, and I believe uh, Rajiv, you have the similar system. Uh, the system comes with a DTI capability of its own. Mm -hmm. If you have the correct raw MRI fed into the system, the system itself can do the DTI processing. Okay. So, so if you use that function, then you can have the tractography and you can later on use the tractography. <laughs> and draw out the tract as an object. So if you're navigating uh, for a glioma, for example, which is very close to the motor tracts, the motor tract can be defined as an object. And while you're working in, of course, there will be brain shift, but it can give you a rough idea of where you are in the motor tracts. So that is definitely doable. Uh, but of course, uh, to set up that, you need some technical support from your vendor and your radiology so that they are giving you the correct raw information. Thank you. So, a couple yes. of comments you, I wanted to make here, uh, and of course, this is more for the benefit of uh, residents and younger people, uh, is that, you know, navigation is an image-guided surgery. So, the accuracy of the navigation depends on the slice thickness and the resolution of your imaging. So I think one of the basic things that Rajiv has showed us very nicely is that the navigation protocol for imaging has to be set up very carefully so that uh, your slice thickness, which you can reconstruct, should be not more than one millimeter thick. If you're using very thick slices, then accordingly, geometrically, your accuracy is going to go down. And the other very, very great error which you can land up with is if the right left orientation from your radiology to your navigation system is off. So once when we were setting up our navigation system around four and a half years ago in Artemis, uh, in one of the cases, we landed up with the probe showing the tumor on the opposite side. Then we realized somebody had gone into the basic uh, uh, the attributes of the navigation system and they had changed the orientation of the images. So sometimes we blindly start using these uh, 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 technology and the basics have to be very, very carefully uh, taken into account to preserve grave errors from happening. Uh, the other thing which I would like to mention is uh, that you see when as navigation becomes cheaper and more and more institutions get access to navigation, uh, we should take care not to lose our basic skills in working without navigation. So for example, a surface lesion to be able to make a small incision without using navigation. It is a skill that all of us have learned during our residency. And the important thing is to keep that skill alive. Because you never know when this high technology piece of equipment may, may crash on you. And you don't want to be suddenly lost in those kind of situations. Absolutely, Dr. Aditya. <coughs> well said, you know. Um, uh, the once you start using navigation, your you know orientation gets. You don't need to use your orientation. These yeah. days, you don't remember any telephone number. You know, Absolutely. in the past, you used to you remember all telephone numbers. Now, it's all there. So that is absolutely correct. And one of the things that I want to again stress what Aditya has said is that in our institute, we we tell the uh, radiographer you take all CT, all MRI, at least one image, whether it's a T2 or T1, on uh, navigation system. So that is one millimeter thickness without gap, so volumetric scan so that you can always feed it. And uh, because you never know when you are going to use that navigation system. And if you don't take it in the first place, then you have to take it again. You know? 
So this is a, a system that we have developed and uh, all, at least in all cases, uh, a CT scan, there's no problem because most of the time it's a one millimeter cuts. So it's not an issue. But in MRI, either T2, most of the time T2 volumetric scan, at least one, which is can be used for stereotactic or navigation is taken, you know, so whenever you need, you can use that image. And one of the things I really loved about Rajiv's uh, mm -hmm. expression is he said that when he do surgery, he take the image again, and then he fuse that in the previous image and compare how he had done it, you know. And that is absolutely the way to go. And that is a very, very important thing that, um, you know, it will teach you, you know, in every case, how you have done. So you can fuse the image, latest image, a post-op image and pre-op image, fuse it. That's what you are telling. And I think that's a wonderful idea. And sometime we are using that as well. Yeah, thank you. Sir, that's very well said, actually. Whenever putting a DBS uh, system, a DBS electrode, there's always better an idea to fuse the post and pre-op and see what all we have done. That's a very good comment. Uh, so do we have any other questions coming? So I'd like to I'd like to make a comment here that you know Rajiv has showed some excellent cases of uh, frameless biopsy, uh, and personally, what I would like to say is that I would not like to do a frameless biopsy of a lesion which is less than one centimeter in diameter. For that, maybe I will go to a frame-based biopsy. Uh, because if you look at the physics studies which had compared all these navigation systems the total end-to-end -end accuracy of these systems is in the region of four millimeters. So if you are four millimeters to one side in a lesion that is one centimeter in diameter, the chances of a geographic miss are substantially higher. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, yeah, absolutely correct. And especially when it's a lesion in the depth, you know, uh, then it's always uh, better to go for uh, stereotaxy rather than, you know, on the surface, stereotaxy is uh, not of use. On the surface, it's horrible. And uh, the jet becomes so long that you don't even can uh, operate, you know. So um, in the depth, uh, absolutely, uh, I agree with Aditya that most of the time the, you know, error is so high that it's better to go for. And sometimes we have combined actually navigation and uh, a stereo taxi we have combined sometimes yeah so i think the only exception i would say is uh, there are studies which show that if you use skull implanted fiducials and you use at least four fiducials which are implanted in the skull then you can achieve an accuracy of close to 1 to 1.5 millimeters Barring that special circumstance uh, one should assume that the end to end accuracy will be Something like four million. Yeah. But when you use a screw type uh, prudentials, then the cost becomes higher, you know, Absolutely. because these are disposables. And it, and it defeats and, uh, the non-invasive nature of what you want to do, right? So if you're poking in four Absolutely. places and then making a smaller incision, patient may not be very happy with that approach. Absolutely. So any more questions, uh, Amit? Uh, 